And now I am excited to um, introduce Dr. Ben Garcia. Um, Dr. Ben Garcia is currently um, the Raymond Whitcoff Distinguished Professor and the head of the Department of Biochemistry and Molecular Biophysics at Washington University School of Medicine in St. Louis. He just moved his lab over from UPenn uh, where he was doing a lot of amazing things. Um, he was a, a presidential professor um, at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, director of quantitative proteomics, um, many, many positions uh, that I won't go into um, all of them. And he has won many awards as well, not surprisingly, um, and uh, including the Human Proteome Organization Discovery and Proteomics Sciences Award. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, he was previously a, a Sloan's fellow earlier on and uh, has also um, named who's who in America. There's just a very long list of awards, um, so I'm not going to name them all, but hopefully you can get a little flavor of all of them. But one thing I really want to say is uh, the Garcia Lab has really been putting innovation in mass spectrometry and proteomics and has significantly in, uh, made huge contributions to the chromatin field, especially in terms of histone modifications and how all of these histone modifications are placed on the nucleosome and how they are involved in during cell transitions and disease states and just a tremendous body of work. And I'm extremely honored to be able to um, hear from, the Gar from Dr. Garcia today. And another thing I really want to mention is uh, not only is uh, Dr. Garcia a phenomenal scientist, Scientist and huge contributor to the field, but he also has been really spearheading a lot of uh, diversity outreach um, efforts. And also, even even in his first year moving over to WashU, he was still so amazing <laughs> and like giving people advice on their faculty applications and everything. It's just pretty phenomenal. So I think we're really lucky to have uh, Dr. Garcia in our field, and I'm really excited to hear uh, what the lab's been up to. And without further Rambling, I will give the floor to Dr. Garcia. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christine, for that really nice uh, introduction and definitely for the invite to be here with you all. Let me go ahead and share my screen. So hopefully you all can see that. Oops, jumped ahead one. Okay. And uh, yeah, so in the short time we have today, um, what I'm hoping to do is just kind of, for those that may not be as familiar with my work, just to give a little bit of update on some of the things that we've been working on, on the technology side, or just more mostly a review of some of the things that we've been working on, and then how we're applying this to a specific uh, problem in cancer biology. And so Petra gave a great um, introduction um, into uh, epigenetics and, and chromatin biology. I'll just expand a little bit. Um, since my talk is going to be focused a little bit more on the histone PTM side of things. And so we have, you know, two copies of um, core histones, H2A, H2B, H3, and H4, um, that um, complex with about 146 base pair of DNA uh, to make the nucleosome. And for a long time, uh, chromatin biologists thought and biologists thought that, you know, these histones were just structural proteins uh, involved in, in making our, our chromosome shape. Um, however, um, over the years, many post-translational modifications have been found on these histones, especially modifications that um, are found on these N-terminal tails that stick out of the nucleosome. And so you're just seeing here in cartoon form the N-terminal tails that kind of stick out of the nucleosome um, with some of the more abundant modifications, just methylations, acetylations, and phosphorylations. And so, um, you know, these modifications were, have been, you know, discovered over the last several decades. And um, in more recent times, um, these modifications have been linked to uh, different transcriptional states. So histone acetylation in general is linked to transcriptional activation. Histone methylation is a little bit different. There's different degrees of methylation, monodiatrimethylation. Um, and so, you know, it can actually be linked to gene activation or silencing. It kind of depends where these modifications are found. And so, uh, you know, methylation on, on lysine 4 of histone H3 is found on the promoter regions of active genes. You go phenylmine acids down to lysine-9 methylation that's actually found on the regions of the genome that are, are not expressed or heterochromatin or, or silence genes for sure. And so because of these kind of 
uh, you know, relationships, many theories and hypotheses have kind of been put forward to try to explain this. One of them is, uh, you know, a, a PTM code or histone code, sometimes you might hear it called, um, where it was thought that maybe these modifications act as some type of code on top of the genetic code um, that then kind of uh, is interpreted um, and leads to specific gene expression states. And if you think about a code, well, there's got to be a way to kind of break that code, interpret that code. And it was postulated that, um, you know, maybe there's proteins with specialized domains that bind specific spots in the genome at these specific modification sites. Um, this is the first step to, um, you know, lead to gene activation or, or gene silencing. Um, but, you know, it's gotten really complex since those days when we were only thinking about methylation or acetylation. Now with an explosion of um, data, both you know, biochemistry, cell biology, and, and mass spectrometry, there's been all kinds of modifications discovered on histones. Things that you might be uh, familiar with, such as methylations and acetylations and phosphorylations on different sites, novel um, PTMs on, on these different histones at different sites, but also all kinds of other modifications as well. Um, Ogliknac, so there's, there's some thought to be some sugars, as well as a whole host of fatty acyl modifications that have, have been discovered um, across many uh, lysine residues. And so right now, this is kind of a, um, this is probably out of date, um, but this is, you know, just showing you a, a snapshot of the chromatin landscape and how complex, um, you know, it really actually can be, um, which, um, you know, for me being an analytical chemist is a great challenge, still is, to detect all these different modifications, identify new ones, and identify which combinations of modifications that occur together because that um, is actually what we think is, is pretty important. And these modifications, epigenetic modifications, along with uh, DNA methylation and um, you know, small non-coding um, or non-coding RNAs, uh, make up these uh, epigenetic mechanisms which influence a lot of aspects of human biology and disease. And in fact, there are several companies right now that have epigenetic oncology divisions where they're developing the next generation epigenetic uh, inhibitors um, to inhibit um, you know, enzymes that uh, modify histones and other chromatin associated proteins. Um, and some of these are, are making their way through clinical trials and FDA approvals. And so you have companies such as big companies such as Pfizer, Eli Lilly that focus on that have some focus on epigenetic therapy and other smaller companies such as Epizyme and um, Constellation that um, only focus in this area. And so there's a lot of interest to really understand you know, how these uh, potential epigenetic mechanisms are driving these different disease states um, and um, you know, if there's a, a way to therapeutically intervene here. And so the traditional approach for looking at histone modifications is with the use of site-specific antibodies. And so, um, and these are for you know, all kinds of, of different types of experiments such as Western blots or ELISAs or immunofluorescence. And so here you're seeing a Western blot with these different histone antibodies, um, uh, you know, using a whole host of, of different organisms and recombinant H3 as a control. And so what you see is that some of these uh, antibodies are pretty good, such as this K9 monomethylation. Uh, it's really not found in yeast, um, but you see it in every other organism. So that looks fine. It doesn't detect recombinant histone H3, which is unmodified. Um, this K79 methylation antibody um, is detecting histone H4 uh, methylation. So there's some cross reactivity there. And this uh, K14 acetyl, I'm not sure what it's detecting because it's actually even detecting the recombinant histone H3. And so you're seeing cross reactivity with other histones and even detecting uh, the unmodified sequence of, of histone H3. So this is a really bad antibody. And, um, you know, but, you know, this is what you can see happening. Um, there's a bigger issue, and that's actually what you can't see happening. And so here's a peptide ELISA assay with an antibody, monoclonal antibody to H3 serine 10 phosphorylation. Um, but the peptides, synthetic peptides, so this is just these peptides incubated in a well. Um, and all these peptides have the serine 10 phosphorylation. These two have acetylation and methylation adjacent to that peptide. And see, this antibody recognizes that phosphorylation really well, but you know, can't really recognize or has trouble recognizing the duly modified peptides. And so this is an issue known as epitope occlusion. And it happens often with histone um, um, antibodies. And so with the histones being so highly densely modified, this is a major issue that is really tough to kind of overcome. So you have to be really careful when you're using your, your antibodies. Um, because of this, we favor using mass spectrometry-based proteomics. Um, we feel it's more unbiased approach. Doesn't matter if there's multiple modifications. We're sequencing the peptides. 
or the pro intact protein. And so, you know, we can look for mass shifts and uh, detect multiple modifications together. And we can do this much more quantitatively than any antibody based uh, type of approach. And so over the years, my lab now has been developing all kinds of different um, approaches to um, quantify histone modifications to make these approaches more high throughput and uh, sensitive uh, to detect all the different combinations of modifications that are found together. And I'll expand on this in a second. Um, combining metabolic approaches uh, with downstream mass spectrometry um, to detect all the different modifications and how fast they're getting put on and taken off by the histone modifying enzymes and combining genomic approaches with proteomics as well, you know, hoping to get to the point where we're taking your favorite gene um, in both health and disease state um, and then looking at the proteins associated with that gene and the histone PTMs that are found there as well. And so we've been really interested in identifying which combinations of histone modifications are found together. This is an important question um, because um, over the years on a case-by-case -case basis, uh, chromatin biologists have found that certain histone modifications are antagonistic or synergistic with one another. And so for example, arginine-3 methylation on histone H4 stimulates acetylation of nearby uh, lysine residues, whereas arginine methylation of histone H3 or R2 actually blocks on the methylation of lysine-4 by the different methyl transferases. And so there's a lot of these relationships that have kind of been um, deciphered over the years um, one by one. Um, but as I kind of showed you before, there's a lot of modifications across uh, the histone tails and really across the whole histone um, sequence. And when you take you know, your protein and digest it into small peptides, which is the common approach in the quantitative proteomics field, um, you know, you can detect this modification on this peptide and this modification on this peptide. But if you ask, well, are these ever found together? Um, that's a hard question to, to answer or else, you know, actually I can't answer that because you lose the connectivity of, of these two peptide sequences. And this is important because, you know, obviously some of these histone modifications turn genes on or off. And so which ones do you actually find together on the same tail? And do you ever see on and off um, modifications found together on, on the same histone tail. What does that mean and under which kind of circumstances? And so over the years, my lab has been really working to develop, um, you know, kind of the next generation mass spectrometry based approaches to try to answer this question, like which combinations of histone modifications are found together. And so we could isolate histones out from basically any cell type or tissue, isolate the histones, we like to focus on the N-terminal peptides where most of the modifications are found or the higher stoichiometry modifications are found. And so we can kind of um, you know, isolate those away from the protein. We've developed a lot of chromatography and mass spectrometry based approaches, which I won't get into, into the technicals, uh, but it allows us to separate out the histone um, forms quite easily. And so this is what the data looks like in the mass spectrometer uh, for just histone H3. This uh, chromatography can separate out the histone by the number of acetylation groups it has. And within one of these groups, it can further separate out the histone H3 by a number of methylation groups it has. And therefore, um, we can isolate one of these groups and then fragment it with um, you know, electron transfer dissociation, which is a kind of a specialized um, um, fragmentation approach for um, longer sequences and intact proteins, and look at the combinations of modifications that occur together. And so now um, we've been generating a lot of data sets and basically trying to ask the question of, do the histone modifications really don't care if they're found together? Do they like to be found together or they really do not like to be found together? And we could do this by taking our observed um, you know, data and um, you know, kind of um, you know, coming up with an interplay score by predicting their coexistence of these modifications. And so now, you know, fast forward um, you know, uh, 14 years and we've been, we've been kind of working on this. So we know that there's a lot of forms of histone H3 greater than 2,500 different modified forms of the same protein, just different combinations of modifications. Some things really like to be found together, others do not, and it does change from cell type to cell type and under various conditions. So now we're kind of building these maps of these histone modifications. And so let me just tell you real quickly um, how we're applying these approaches uh, to various, uh, to this one problem in, in cancer biology. And so we've been interested in, in sarcomas. They're pretty rare tumors of mesenchymal origins. You can see here, uh, much less uh, frequent than lung or breast cancer, but there's many types that have been uh, determined over the years. And, you know, just because a cancer is rare doesn't mean it's not important. It's definitely important to that patient that suffers from the rare tumor, but there's also a lot you can learn um, by, um, you know, studying some of these rare cancers. And cancers in general have a lot of mutations to the histone 
um, you know, machinery or even the histones themselves or, or chromatin proteins. And so two of the more highly uh, mutated um, uh, families um, are the sweat sniff uh, complex and the polycomb repressive complex. They have kind of opposing function uh, where polycomb kind of methylates histone H3 leading to gene uh, silencing. And this ATP dependent chromatin remodeler actually uh, you know, allows for transcription and nucleosome sliding. Um, but you can see here, they're both highly mutated across many cancers um, and polycomb, especially in, in some blood cancers. And so when you look at mesenchymal tumors, um, you'll see all kinds of different mutations to various types of, of chromatin machinery, um, loss or gain of function to the SWISNF or polycomb complex, a lot of shared translocations where you know, histone acetyltransferase is fused to um, a transcription factor or another protein, um, you know, really unclear how that um, drives pathogenesis and even mutations to the histones themselves. And so my lab has really been interested in mal a malignant peripheral nerve sheet tumor, MPNST. It's a sarcoma um, that is both sporadic and syndromic. And so it can kind of progress from a neurofibroma um, or it can just sporadically occur. Um, it's a pretty rare tumor, probably one in one million people um, will be afflicted with this type of cancer, but it's a very um, serious cancer with low kind of overall survival rate. Um, not a lot of options for treatments, just basically surgical resection and radiation. Um, about 85% of these MPNSTs have mutations to EED or SUS12, which are components of PRC2 complex. And I mentioned this before, this is an enzyme complex that methylates histone H3. And in fact, pathologists actually use histone H3 as a marker to distinguish um, the different types of MPNSTs. Um, and so Here's MPNST that has a uh, polycomb retained, and you can see it's staining for the histone H3 a marker, whereas in the polycomb loss, you lose the H3 marker. But H3, uh, you know, K27 trimethylation may not be the best marker because this loss occurs in many different cancers. And so what we wanted to understand was, um, you know, we know the initial insult is going to be the mutation of the PRC2 component, but how does the epigenome reprogram? Um, and so we're gonna use a quantitative proteomics to look at other changes that occur on histone proteins. And then once there's changes on histone proteins, there's probably changes in gene expression and, and protein expression. So we're gonna use quantitative proteomics to um, assess those changes. And this was driven by a former postdoc in the group, John Wosick. And I'll skip some of this, um, but John had to really kind of convince himself that he could get high quality samples out of uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded samples. So anytime there's a surgery, um, you know, the, uh, the tumor will be taken out and basically stored in these wax chunks forever. And so John had to really convince himself that he could get high quality epigenomes and proteomes out of these samples, and he did. Um, he was able to show that if he took a fresh versus a formula fixed paraffin embedded liver sample, um, got about the same number of proteins and, and data out of uh, that. Um, and so the, the quality was quite high. And even if he went back many years, he can you know, detect a lot of proteins with similar abundances. So he was pretty happy with that. And with regards to the histone uh, modifications, very good correlation between fresh and fixed uh, liver sample um, and the histone H3 K27 peptides, which we're interested in um, because that's where the mutation is gonna affect primarily. Um, he got very good correlation between tumors from patients and uh, patient drive cell lines. And so what he did was he took um, FFP samples from neurofibroma, MPNST loss, or um, uh, MPNST that had polycomb retained. So these had a different mutation. You can see there's something very different about the polycomb loss uh, samples. And this is looking at about 150 histone modification sites um, and variants, just using a uh, principal component analysis. If you look, do a volcano plot of the top histone 50, uh, top 50 histone PTMs or so, you see that you do get the loss of the K27 um, peptides and the MPNST loss. Um, and you can see that here in the dimethyl and trimethyl from neurofibroma to MPNST retained polycomb loss. You see this loss of the K27 um, dimethylated and trimethylated peptides. But there's other things that change as well, both silencing and active marks. And you can see here, a lot of active marks are actually upregulated in these patients that have the polycomb mutation. Um, these are all histone acetylation, um, histone H4 acetylation levels that all increase in these patients that have the polycomb loss, some H3 acetylation, and even uh, K36 dimethylation, mono and dimethylation of histone H3 go up as well. And this is because um, we actually found that these two peptides, uh, these two marks, the silencing mark and active mark are found together. Um, but when you lose the mutation, basically um, you lose all of the modifications on the K27, the K36 is found alone. 
And so what our data was kind of suggesting is that there's parts of the genome that have K27 dye and trimethylation, and even K27 dye and trimethylation with active marks as well. But in the disease state, you lose the saliency marks, so you just have mostly active marks um, you know, that are found. And so um, the other nice thing that we saw in our data was that um, you know, before they were, uh, pathologists were only using K27 trimethyl as a marker for this MPNST, but we found that K27 dimethyl also decreases. And you can see that from the polychrome retained, that stain, polychrome loss that lose that. Um, and this is important because there's a lot of cancers that lose K27 trimethyl, but MPNST is one of the few that lose K27 tri and dye together. Um, so you can see these other cancers actually do not lose dye for whatever reason, something we're still trying to figure out. So these two uh, together are a better marker than the one alone for MPNST. In terms of quantitative proteomics, we want to see how the proteome was changing because of these epigenome changes. And so we did quantitative proteomics on the top 5,000 proteins or so. We see a lot of things being upregulated. Go term analysis shows they're all things that maintain an open active chromatin and also uh, promote cancer growth. And this is something that is uh, you know, consistent with our histone data. We go from a silencing to more open active state. And the proteome is you know, all the proteins you would imagine that is needed to keep an open active transcriptional state. But you'll see that there's a lot of things that are downregulated too. And when we do go term analysis, these are all things involved in interferon uh, signaling immune response. And you can see this just by kind of looking at the MHC class one, class two peptides. Um, Polychrome retained patients have a higher levels of, of these uh, MHC molecules and polychrome loss. And you could see this just by the immunohistochemistry staining of these HLA molecules from the polychrome retained to the polychrome loss. There's you know, down regulation of these peptides. And so essentially, once you have the polychrome loss, you get a more open active chromatin. It allows for cancer growth, but also to keep a, a chromatin, an open active chromatin. But there's a down regulation of the immune response, presumably to make these patients more immunocompromised. And so big question is, how do you lose a repressor such as PRC2 and get more repression? Um, and why don't you just get runaway transcription? And so John looked at the data and actually found that this uh, DNA methyltransferase, DMNT3A, is upregulated. And these patients have a higher levels of DNA methylation, which is a silencing mark. So you go from polychrome retained uh, patients that have low levels, the red is low, uh, blue is high. So in the polychrome loss, they have higher levels of DNA methylation. And um, go term analysis of, of these promoters shows that it's everything involved um, that we saw being downregulated before um, in the immune response. And so essentially, you know, once you lose polycomb, DNA methylation takes over um, and silences um, the immune response pathways in these patients. And so what happens if we kind of manipulate these pathways? At least in cells, we can restore polycomb activity and we can knock down NSC2, the K36 methyltransferase, inhibit with DNA methylation inhibitors. And so if this is the normal state where you have some parts of the genome that have K27 and K36 methylation together, in the disease state, you lose the K27, so you have the K36 alone, what happens if we restore SUS12 activity so we get the K27 methylation back, or um, we just remove the K36 and get to this state? You know, is this better than this state? And so we can add SUS12 back um, into these cells. And when we add SUS12 back, we can actually IP the whole complex in the cells that do not have, or that have the mutated SUS12, we can't mutate, we can't isolate out the whole complex, but when we add back SUS12 that's active, we can get the whole complex. When we add the whole complex back, um, the methylation levels increase for K27. We can knock down NSD2. When we knock down NSD2, we knock down the K36 methylation levels. And if we look at the SUS12 add back or the NSD2 knockdown and look at the whole proteome, we can see it's affecting the same genes. And so indeed we have silencing and active marks together in the genome and it's affecting the same numbers of genes, uh, the same exact genes. With regards to cell growth, um, you know, if we knock down NSD2 in the background of the polychrome retained cells, they don't care. We knock down NSD2 with the polychrome lost cells. Um, these cells are very sensitive to that. And um, with uh, the K, we can put in a K36 uh, methylation transgene. So we remove K36 methylation. So it's a K36M mutation there. Um, these cells, um, you know, not very sensitive uh, to this, uh, you know, adding this uh, K36 transgene. But when we add this in uh, to the cells that have the background polychrome loss, they're very sensitive to this. I'm going to skip a couple of slides, um, but just to kind of get to the punchline. Um, the last experiments we did was basically that, um, you know, 
there is no NSD2 inhibitor and, you know, restoring a gain, a loss of function mutation is, is not an easy strategy in patients. And so we thought, well, is there another opportunity uh, for therapeutic intervention? And so with the polycomb loss, it leads to histone acetylation increase. Um, and we thought if we add an HSAC inhibitor, maybe we could get to the point where we're inducing cytotoxicity. Um, and that's because the histone acetylation levels are actually much higher in the polycomb loss cells than the polycomb retain. And if we had the HSAC inhibitor, we actually even go to even higher levels. So we think we can reach this state. And so if we have the cells that have um, the polycomb retained, this is kind of their growth kill curve. When we increase the concentrations of panobinostat, the HSAC inhibitor, um, here are three different cell types that have the polycomb mutation. So they're much more sensitive to increasing concentrations of the HSAC inhibitor. When we add the HSAC inhibitor, um, we get re-expression of a lot of the immune response proteins that uh, consistent with what we saw before. Additionally, um, we can, you know, kind of play that game of adding the SUS12 back and so restoring the function of the polycomb protein. And when we do that, um, you can see that these cells are more resistant to the increasing concentrations of the panobinostat inhibitor. And uh, remember, DNA methylation is increased in these uh, patients that have uh, the polycomb mutation. So if we add increasing concentrations of the panobinostat HDAC inhibitor, and a DNA methylation um, inhibitor as well, these cells are much more sensitive than just the panobinostat concentration, the HDAC inhibitor alone. And so overall with the quantitative proteomics approach, we've kind of learned a lot about what happens after the initial insult of losing the polycomb repressive to complex activity. We have an open active chromatin um, in certain parts of the genome, uh, histone acetylation, um, you know, K36 methylation levels kind of increase um, and this leads to kind of, uh, you know, promotion of, of cancer signaling pathways, aberrant differentiation, and open active chromatin. But there's also DNA methylation levels that take over um, and also silence, um, you know, proteins involved uh, in the immune response to make these patients more immunocompromised. And so, in summary, we found a lot about, um, you know, this um, really interesting uh, specific type of sarcoma. Um, you know, unfortunately, there's a, a lot of work to still do um, because, you know, there's no NSD2 inhibitor, and we want to understand a lot of the relationships between some of these epigenetic modifications, such as the K36 and, and uh, methylation and DNA methylation, um, and also trying to understand, um, you know, if we can further kind of um, exploit the immune response connection to MPNST uh, for, you know, combinatorial therapy of epigenetic inhibitors and maybe immune uh, checkpoint inhibitors as well. And with that, I thank the current lab um, that's here with me at WashU or continuing this project and previous member John Wosick who had started it. I'd be happy to answer any questions if there are any. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was fantastic. I'm amazed that he was, John, it sounds like he was able to get all of that from those preserved tissue samples. That's really cool. Um, we already have a few questions, um, so I'll go ahead and start asking them. But meanwhile, if you all would like to raise your hand um, to ask a question, I can request that you unmute yourself and you can ask yourself. Um, so we have three questions from Al Shaima Ali. Um, I'll start with just one and then maybe um, let other people ask questions too. Um, so one of the questions, let's see, which one should we ask? Um, I'll ask the most recent one. Do you think that H3K36 trimethylation increases, which is why DNMT3A increases to recognize the K36 trimethyl mark using its PWWP domain, so then it will deposit more DNA methylation? Um, I guess they're asking, what do you think the mechanism of that process is? Yeah, so there's been a couple papers in the last like year or two. Um, you know, so uh, that DNA methyltransferase uh, 3A does have this PWWP domain that has been shown to bind um, a methylated histone uh, H3 at lysine 36. It can bind both K36 di and trimethyl. And so in this particular project, we didn't see an increase in trimethyl K36, but dimethyl. And so, yeah, that is one of the hypotheses that we have is that um, there's parts of the, of the genome that have like the K27 trimethyl with the K36 dimethyl together on the same tail of the histone. 
And when you lose the 27 trimethyl, then you just have this K36 dimethyl exposed. And that is recruiting that DNA methyl transferase through its PWP domain um, you know, to the specific spots in the genome at those promoters. Um, so that is something that we um, you know, are trying to work through with some chip seek experiments right now um, and, some, and some mutants, yeah. Yeah, that kind of dovetails with their other question is if you saw some K36 dye in gene bodies, but it sounds like you're doing chip seek. <laughs> so We're doing it right now. Yeah, yeah cool. we just couldn't get it uh, done in time before the pandemic and then oh, gosh. Uh, moving <laughs> and, you know, John moving on as well. Um, yeah, it's been slowed down a little bit, but this is this yeah. is exactly what we want to do is try to sort a lot of this out with some chip seek. Yeah, that'd be awesome. Ben Martin is here to ask a question, it looks like. <laughs> Talk. Um, I had a question with your um, your PRC2 mutant uh, cancer cells, it, where you've got DNA methylation compensating. Have you looked at things like transposable elements and if those are getting transcribed or activated? Because I know that they don't always overlap completely with which ones they can repress. Yeah, no, we haven't looked at that at all. So, I mean, there's a few other things that people kind of, um, you know, threw out to, that we should look at. So there is a little bit of a short list of things to do. That is something that, that someone um, had, had mentioned in the group, but we haven't looked at that yet. That ties in at all with your immune gene activation? Yeah, possibly. Yeah, no, it's a good question. Um, it looks like uh, Ajaz Wani, you have your hand raised, so I'm going to allow you to talk. Uh, I actually I raised my hand uh, in the previous talk. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> well, well, well. If you have a question for Dr. <laughs> Garcia, you can feel free to ask. But if you have one for Petra, you can um, email it or mention it in the chat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No. So I have a question for both. So, oh, okay. <laughs> so then I can uh, go ahead with the doctor, uh, Professor uh, Garcia. So basically, uh, yeah. So I'm. We are trying some mass spec with the histones. Mm -hmm. So I'm using uh, Snap G2 from the watchers. Okay. And, uh, but uh, we didn't, we are having a tough time to get the coverage uh, of the histones. These are just Genopus histones. So we are mixing it with some other proteins and but with the other protein, chromatin associated protein, but we're having pretty tough time to get the enough coverage uh, for the, I mean, obviously we are already losing the tails uh, but we are having a tough time to get the coverage for the core. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, definitely follow up with a with an email to me, and I could put my um, email in the chat. Um, but yeah, there could be a lot of different reasons uh, for for that to happen. Um, and so um, ultimately, like you mentioned, the tails are very hydrophilic, and so yeah. they probably won't stick onto C eighteen columns unless you yeah. do kind of what we do, which is like derivatize them first. Um, and make them more hydrophobic. So that's one thing. Um, the other thing is also, uh, I, I don't know what kind of like LC you're using and if it's like nanoflow or high flow it's type nanoflow. of, it's, it's nanoflow. nanoflow. Okay, so you're in the right regime. Um, but yeah, sometimes some of the conditions of the LC um, have to be kind of tweaked because the histones don't behave very well in these columns. And so that also could be, you know, one of the issues. Um, a lot of the work we do I've never worked on the synapse, so I, I don't know, you know, its sensitivity and dynamic range and things like that. I've heard good things about it, but I don't know how it compares to like an ion trap or orbi trap. Um, so a lot of our, our workflows are, are kind of made for like the orbi trap, but um, you know, you can email me and I can put you in contact with some people in my lab. Maybe there might be a few things we can point you in the right direction. Thanks a lot. So we are we have ordered an uh, RB for IT. Explorers. So oh, okay. Yeah, no, that should be great. I think a few months. Uh, okay. So, yeah, can I ask quickly one short, uh, quick question to the pressure? Oh, so, no. um, well, no? we ha just in case we have more questions for Dr. Garcia, if you, you can go ahead and um, message Petra. So, <laughs> so, so she had some questions already. So we want to make sure because we have another one in the Q and A for sure, Dr. Please, Garcia. Yeah. So, <laughs> thank you though. See you in the future. <laughs> um, we had another question in the Q and A um, about um, high throughput con combinatorial histones, and we were they were wondering if you could distinguish um, histone PTMs found on both histone copies, or if you like, have you been able? That's a really cool question. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So talking about um, you know 
you have two copies of each histone and nucleosome, what do they look like? Are they the same? Um, can you distinguish? And so you actually can, but it's it's a Ooh, pretty awesome. intricate experiment. <laughs> Um, but we had, um, we've had a couple of papers now that we've published where we've combined um, some like chips and sequential chip type of, of papers to try to understand some things like the, you know, bivalent marks and, and mm -hmm. things like that. And so, yeah, you actually can get at that, but they're, they're definitely experiments that are tough and not for the faint of heart <laughs> because right. they require a lot of material um, and work, but you actually can. And so there are, awesome. there are some histone marks um, that do tend to be found on both copies within nucleosomes and then other things that are probably more likely on each of the of the different histone copies. Mm -hmm. That's really cool. Yeah, I always am interested in that as well. So <laughs> neat. Um, cool. And we're actually out of time. Um, so I think, you know, uh, thank Dr. Garcia and Petra, who soon to be Dr. Tomorrow, right? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay. <laughs> Um, well, thank you both so much. Project for here, hopefully, yeah. Okay, yes, almost doctor. <laughs> thank you both so much for fantastic seminars and thank you all for your questions. And like I said, um, feel free to reach out um, by email or if you are on the Discord, um, I think Petra is definitely on Discord so you can uh, reach out to her there. Um, but without further um, uh, rambling again, um, I guess I will let everyone go and thank you all. Have a fabulous week and we'll see you in two weeks.